Jade and Betty. Thank you for doing this. It's nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Um, I think this may that. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your experience? Um, how you got into PR? How like how you're here now? And yeah, tell us. A okay. Little bit. Yeah. Cool. Well, my journey began. I was ten, very young, very long time ago. Um, and you know, when you're around ten, eleven, and twelve, people start asking you what you want to do when you grow up, mm -hmm. and at the time I wanted to be a doctor because they made lots of money. Um, and then I realized I hated the sight of blood. So that wasn't going to work for me, but I spent a lot of time in the library. I love reading. I love researching. I love finding out information. I love asking questions. And I look, looked up the type of careers that you could have with those skills and journalism popped up. And I went, you know what? That, that sounds pretty good in my 10 year old head. So I started working as a journalist around when I was 15 um, and did that for many, many years, writing articles on, you name it, all types of topics from forklifts to sport to new technologies to general news to politics, <coughs> pardon me, politics. And then um, when I went, I don't know whether I like the media industry very much. Um, I moved into corporate communication. So I went on the other side of the fence and I worked with a number of large not-for-profit organisations doing their um, internal and external um, media. So internal was things like annual reports, magazines, speeches, things like that. External was media relations, you know, connecting the organisations with their key messages to the media so that we got some great PR. And then, um, like a lot of people, one day they tapped me on the shoulder and said, uh, we don't need you anymore. Mm -hmm. And I started my business, so it was about eight, nine years ago, it's called Publicity Genie. Uh -huh. And I set out to teach people how to do their own PR because I thought, you know, 20 plus years as a journalist, you know, 10 plus years in corporate comms, I think I know a little bit about this stuff. Yeah. And then eventually it just transitioned into doing it for people because it was far less painful for me just to go, listen, I'll just take care of this for you. Um, so I've been doing that ever since. And um, this year I started a new agency with my friend, Lauren Clement, the Audacious Agency. And we do a bit of a hybrid between um, brand building and pub public relations um, mixed in with books and awards and um, you know, creating great content. Nice. Um, um, all right, I have a few questions just based. That was a great intro. Thank you very much. Um, I have a few questions. Why, number one, why did you get sick of the media industry? Why did you, not to get sick of it, but why did you decide that you didn't like it? I, I love the writing and I love the reporting and I love that side of it. I love the news. But I didn't necessarily love the people there are a few things that happened. You know, at the time I was in my mid-20s, very idealistic, very principled, and I saw a few things happen that made me question whether I wanted to have to act in a certain way for either to move up the ranks and to get a story over the line. So I, I kind of went, oh, I don't really want to do that. I don't want to have to compromise myself. And just kind of, I walked away, you know, it was my dream of, you know, since I was 10 and it was a really difficult one to make. But I think when I look back, it was the right one because I'm not quite sure maybe I would have liked the person that I would have become if I'd continued down that path. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. I um, also started off in journalism and the reason I stopped working in it was I was interning at like, Sky News and they were saying because I really wanted to be like you know a hard news reporter even though that's not my personality at all and they said do you have to do something called a death knock you know like we have to go and like knock on someone's house after someone's died I was like oh hell no <laughs> I don't want to do that and then in my head that's what it was and then I, in, I did like a beauty magazine for a few years but it just it doesn't pay enough either right like I mean sorry to all the journos out there but the other side to me like PR and comms has paid loads more Oh, absolutely. And look, content really has lost its value, particularly mm -hmm. over the last, like even the last five years. I mean, like trying to sell your content to a publication 
you know, that they're just not going to do it because they can just go and lift content off Twitter or off Instagram or off Facebook and run that as a story. And to me, that's not news. That's lazy journalism. And I know not all journalists are lazy. I'm not saying that. But just the, the direction that the media is heading, mm-hmm. it's, it's not really something that, you know, I wanted to be a part of. And it's far more empowering and inspiring to work with people in business and find lots of other little ways that they can promote and build their brand um, without having to necessarily be on Sky News or, you know, The Sun or any of those big tabloidy type of newspapers. Interesting. Okay, cool. So you started off helping people to try and, well, you started off in corporate comms and then you, from there you went to try and help like business owners and people get themselves into PR. Is, is that something that you still do through the audacious agency? I, I know you said that it's sometimes a little more painful when you've got to help people do it themselves. We do our, our color. <coughs> oh my goodness. Oh no. Hey, fever. It's terrible this time of year. There's just all these native trees that are flowering. Pew, pew, yeah. pew, and they're like pew pewing all over me. Um, we do a bit of a, a hybrid PR at the Audacious Agency. Mm-hmm. So we have a really collaborative approach. So we always start with a strategy. So we look, you know, what are the things that you need to do over the next 12 months mm-hmm. to go from, you know, who are you to do we want you. And that's like, we call it dropping breadcrumbs. How many breadcrumbs can we drop through traditional media, through third tier media, through social media, through speaking, through podcast, you know, all of those many different channels that we have now to be able to reach out and connect people. And if someone, you know, we create this strategy when they say to us, actually, I can do this, this and this, but I need help with this. We'll come up with a package that will be, well, you go off and do this bit, we'll coach you through this part of the process so that they're learning and growing at the same time. So we're not necessarily doing formal PR classes. We we bespoke everything that we do because everybody's different. And I found that doing the DIY PR, it's like I put hundreds of people through my programs mm-hmm. and I can probably count on one hand how many people actually use that knowledge and went on to use it because when you're in small business you're already you know the the expert in everything in your business you've got to do your finances you've got to do your admin you've got to do customer service you've got to do this you've got to do that and then on top of that pr people are like crushed by it and it's like much so we just went well how can we still help them get the wins and learn the process because as a PR agency, one of the biggest killers is expectation and unrealistic expectations because everybody wants to be on the news, everybody wants to be on the front page, but not everybody can, not everybody's got that newsworthy story. So they'll come, you know, but in the past they'd come to us and go, we want to be on this show. And we go, well, like you and 5,000 other people, look, we'll, we'll put a pitch in, but why don't we do all of these other things as well? And a lot of people go, that's low hanging fruit, not interested. And it's like, <laughs> well, you know, some fruit's better than no fruit. Yeah. Book. <laughs> so if a person understands the process, yeah. then their expectations are more manageable. That's a really interesting approach, like the breadcrumb approach. And is that advisable so that you are taken more seriously and there is more, it it shows like proven interest in you via podcast views, via video views. It's like proof of concept for a person to the journalist when they're researching that person. Absolutely. What's one of the first things you do when you start working with someone or you're looking uh, into you know, a partnership with someone or, you know, whatever it is that you're doing, we Google people or we go onto Facebook and we search them. So those breadcrumbs uh, enable you to show up very organically within a search so that if a journalist is going, you know, hey, I'm looking for an expert in um, accounting and you've been blogging, you've been guest posting, you've been writing articles 
for a contribution site. You might have been quoted in a few papers. You've been in oodles of podcasts. You've won an award or two. You may have even have been part of a book anthology about business <laughs> processes and practices. And that all comes up in that search if you're really methodical and process driven about how you push your brand out there. Um, and the, the, even the problem with getting in the media. So if you just want traditional mainstream media coverage, mm. not every publication puts a searchable link to your story online. There's, I know there's probably hundreds of stories I don't even know have run or are out there because they, it's, not, it's almost impossible to find. And a lot of the time the journalists don't tell you that they've run the story. So the more that you can create your own PR, the better it is that you show up. Oh my God, that has blown my mind. Wait, <laughs> Wait so you, they might actually, yeah, did you hear it? It's splattered on the walls. So journalists might <laughs> have a story about you and not even tell you. Oh, all the time all the time. Every month I'll go do a, a Google search of you, whoever the client is that we're working for. And, you know, occasionally a, like I'll find a story and go, oh, I pitched that like three months ago. Uh, you know, and I've even written back to them and said, you know, just seeing if you're using the story, do you need anything else? Here's some photos. Here's another idea. And you never hear back from them. Right. And then you find that they've used... <laughs> used your media release word for word with the byline on it. You've gone, all right, well, that probably would have been nice to know, but I'm going to take that win, high five. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's, got worth, it's worth this advertising space. Okay, so like, so we're, we're breadcrumbing, we're putting podcasts out there, hopefully we've won some awards, bloody hell, awards, that sounds scary. Um, we're doing all the things to look credible, right? What what does a brand need to do first and foremost when they're thinking about reaching out to the media? They need to make sure that their, their, their shop front, their website, whatever that is, is approachable. You know, that they've got great images on there, that they've got um, their bio on there or their About Us page, which is really succinct and clear about what they do and how they do it. They really need to understand their target audience because a lot of people think that, you know, they can just talk to everybody and that's good enough. Um, and they also really need to understand the journalist as their target audience as well. So when the journalist goes looking for them on their website, they've got a media page and all of that beautiful information about them is all there, the links to other stories, images that can be downloaded, you know, their bio that can be downloaded. Maybe if they're looking to get on TV, there's some video of them speaking so the journalist knows that they don't have two heads and they can actually string a word together. I can't tell you the number of times that um, as a journalist, I've been given a lead for a story, rung that person and it was like pulling teeth. It was like, you don't want to be doing that. So make sure your shop front's right, that your real estate, which is your website, has got what they need to find, that they don't have to, you know, keep scrolling down, you know, under the fold, looking for information about you, how to contact you. Make sure your contact details are really easy to find. You know, maybe up in the top right-hand corner of your website so that they can just go, oh, okay, I can ring that person or I can email them ring as much as they used to they tend to email so get that right right from the start you know I've worked with people who like in in Australia over 50 percent of businesses don't have a website what yeah crazy I don't know what it's like where you are but here it's kind of mental to think that this very almost easy thing that you can do there's so many DIY things out there like Wix, um, GoDaddy that you could create your own website and they're not doing it. It's like, well, like I've actually got a client in the UK. She's a beauty therapist and she said she's one of the few beauty therapists that have a website where people can actually go and read about her, read about her skills and her expertise and find out what services that she has. 
Mm, that's absolutely bloody mental. Fifty percent. The websites. I'm in um, Sydney as well, by the way. I, I just have um, a UK accent. Okay. But, uh, I know Lisa from um, Manchester. Well, although my accent is not as modern as Lisa's, mine's very, very messed up. Um, so, all right. So. I did not even think about the idea of a media page on your website with like a bio and stuff. Like I, you know, you have the about us, but that's, the, you always think that's almost like for corporates or something, don't you? Yeah, uh, you do. But the, like, if you think about how many small businesses there are in Australia mm -hmm. and they make up almost 90% of business. Wow. So, and, and you have, when you have organisations like the ABC who are proactively looking for particularly women in business to feature, um, because women in media are really underrepresented, is that journalists are going out and looking for these people. And if you've got a website that is, you know, you've got that media page, you've got your SEO nailed so you're easy to find, you understand your keywords, You've got content on there which keeps your website alive and vibrant. Then you just make it easy for them. And this in this age where media are just being decimated, journalists are having to work harder for less with less resources. If you make it easy for them, they're going to love you. You're going to be great talent, and they're going to lap you up. Yeah, I've, I've heard that, um, especially, you know, in your reference to the media release earlier, and then it's um, reused with the byline of the journalist, because so many journalists especially have been let go, and then they're all, so the ones that remain end up doing three jobs, they actually do need help with the writing. So if we are, like, writing a media release or a press release, as it's known in the UK, what, what sort of things do you need to be put in, in there? Is it necessary to still have a media or press release? You know, if you'd asked me this maybe 12 months ago, I would have said, yes, absolutely. Oh. But I'm now of the opinion that, like, you can come to me and I'll write your media release for 600 bucks. Right. You're tapping into the resources of a 30-plus year journalist, writer, um, you know, PR person, like I understand how a media release gets put together. I understand how to get it out there. But most of the time, it doesn't really have the impact that you would think it does. Mm. Now, there's a, a, a company in um, Brisbane called Stone and Wood. They're a PR agency. And they've got this new product called um, Reach Me. I think it's or Release Me, something like that. I'll find out the right name. They actually do video releases so if you're looking at getting into TV news, because journalists can't come in most cases to do the filming, you engage them to do your one to 90, one minute to 90 second video release and you package it because they're journalists, they understand that, you know, what chance do you stand of getting your story run ahead of someone who sent a boring old media release? Like yeah. you've got a lot better chance. And coming back to where I was, I was heading is that, you know, a lot of the time, if you pay someone to do it or you labor over it yourself. And I used to teach people how to write media releases and I stopped because it was like watching people bang their head against a brick wall. It's a skill, you know, knowing how to put that together is an art. It's far easier just to go. So my media release hack is this dear journalist, I'm sending you this story because I think it'll be of interest to your audience and give some indication you know who their audience is and what they like. Um, this is the reason why I think this story would be good for you. And then follow who, what, when, where, how and why. Who's the story about? What's the story about? Why is the story about? How? You know, is it online? Is it in person? Um, who, what, when, where, how, why? When is it? You know, is it an event? Is it um, for down the track? Give them the answers to those questions with some dot points, key points around the story and say to them, you know, if you're interested in this story, I'm going to give you a call in a couple of days. If you're not, get back to me and tell me you're not. Oh, 
Wow. Because if you tell them you're going to call them and they're like, oh, this person calling me, they actually <laughs> respond to you. <laughs> wow, that's a really good hack. You know, it's interesting as well. I find in Australia um, that the journalists are a lot friendlier. When I was in the UK, like, I mean, no offense, but I worked in PR in the UK for a little while and it was, it was hell, man. But here, like, I send press releases to Vogue thinking that they're never going to get back to me. And they do every time. And that, and like, um, you know, other massive publications, daily newspapers that are huge get back to you here. Whereas I find in other countries that doesn't always happen. Yeah, I, th I think so. That that's the kind of that Australian Australianism, is it? You know, she'll be right, mate. You know, no worries. Is that you know, regardless of how cutthroat the media industry is, that yeah. you know, they're still Aussies. We're still like, you know, oh yeah, okay, we can see that. You know, we'll help you out, or we'll let you know. So yeah, I, you're right. I've pitched overseas before, and it's like, oh my god, I'm sorry. Did I just step on your grandmother? I didn't mean to, you know, poor. And look, and you appreciate it if a journalist gets back to you and goes, not our cup of tea, mate, or not for us at this time, I think we'll pass. Or the good one is, yeah, we love this. Can we give you a ring? It's like, yeah. hell yeah, of course you can. That's the goal. And um, do you think as well, it's like, do you have to have a photo shoot before you send a media release? Like, do you have to have proper professional photos? Look, it depends on... on what you're pitching like a picture does speak a thousand words that's still true you know we're still drawn to those images um definitely have a professional headshot uh, landscape sorry portrait and landscape because it depends on the media outlet as to what so if you can offer them both without them having to come back and ask you that's a tick in your favor if you've got products that you're pitching to a gift guide or to a, a fashion magazine, I would definitely have really high quality um, images so that the journalist doesn't have to organise a photo shoot. Um, and, and if you're dip, put, dipping your feet into that water in the product space and you've got a target um, media contact list, I would even reach out to them beforehand and introduce yourself, create a media kit, go into Canva, They've got heaps of templates. Okay. Put in your bio a little bit about your business, a little bit about the product that you have, you know, a few images that you can show them what it is and then ask them what they're looking for. You know, hey, we've got this great product that we've, we've created. Uh, you know, we really think that it aligns with your audience. Uh, would you be interested? We can send you some samples. What type of images would you like? Or even before you do that, do your research. And understand what type of content that they're looking for so when you deliver it up they go these people understand what we're looking for they've made it easy for us wow okay so a media kit i, I when i used to blog we were told that we needed a media kit and i never actually created one so that's when you're saying it's like you've got information about you what you're selling um photos in there and that just makes you look more professional yeah, you, know, you might have won some awards or, you know, just everything that adds substance to your story and your pitch. And it makes it so they don't have to go looking for yeah. that information. Yeah, so you're basically anticipating any questions or things that the journalists might need first. And every time that you do that, you get a tick in their favour and they're more likely to work with you because you make their life easier. Yeah, absolutely. And look... I mean, you don't want to give them everything because you want to be able to keep your powder dry enough so that you can go back to them and say, you know, maybe that pitch didn't grab you, but here's a little bit more information. So, you know, like a media release or a pitch is only ever bait and they may not take that bait. So you may want to keep a few things up your sleeve so that you can go back and maybe entice them from this side or from that side or from that side, because, you know, and look, this is the thing with pitching to the media. Sometimes they don't respond mm. because they don't get it. It's gone to spam. They're away on holidays and they come back to 7 million emails. And I don't know about you, is after 300, I've gone, I'm just deleting them all and starting again. Yeah. I don't 
if he messaged me, if it was important, they'll get back to me. Um, or it may be that they've run the story before. Never be afraid to go back and say, you know, hey, where was my pitch lacking? What was it? You know, and they may go, oh, hey, you know, I didn't actually get it. Can you send it to me again? That's where the phone's handy. A lot of journalists don't like to be wrong, but I just say, you know, if you, and this is where your research comes in. If you understand the media outlet you're pitching to, what the deadlines are. So if it's a newspaper, ringing someone at three o'clock in the afternoon when they're heading to that five o'clock deadline, you're going to get your head snapped off. Yeah. Um, a magazine, like they've got two, three month lead times. So research that information so that when you do ring, you're not, you know, getting them at, you know, while they're furiously trying to get something over the line. Same with radio, TV. Like you don't read a TV news station at three o'clock in the afternoon. You ring them in the morning when they're just planning and preparing their day because who knows, they might have a gap in their news yeah. and the person that's just rung up at the right time with that amazing lead and you're in the news. Okay. Yeah, I think a lot of people, especially women, would um, be, and I do generalise there from talking to my friends and contacts about this, is that we're scared to, like, harass journalists. Like, in our eyes, it's harassment. So I've sent off media releases and they're never followed up because I'm too scared of it. I'm just like, well, if they didn't reply, it mustn't be that interesting. Like, it wouldn't even occur to me to do that. Do you think that's something a lot of people are thinking? Uh, absolutely. Who wants to be an annoying person? <laughs> like, I certainly don't. And this is my living. But the power is in the follow-up. Yeah. Because all of those reasons that I just said, they didn't see it, it went into spam, they've been on the holidays. You know, whatever that is, is that if you don't follow up, you'll never, never know. And they may have put it in their to-do list to go, need to call that person back. Something else has come up. Sometimes you have to be the squeaky wheel. And those people who are prepared to do that are the ones that you see are in the media all the time because they suck. Like, what's the worst thing a journalist can say to you? Like, bugger off. That's true. Yeah. What's the, what's the worst thing? And that's the thing is that they can only say no or yes. Yeah. So if you don't follow up, you just never know. Now, I've, I've followed up stories for months. I have been that annoying person. Wow. And I have gotten stories over the line because I've kept following up and I've just got them at the right time. And they've gone, you know what? We've got spot this month for that story. I'm like, yes, thank you very much. And so like you were saying like a follow-up email is something like, you know, dear XXX, just wanted to check that you've got this. Is there anything, any more information you needed or? Um, like I don't say just checking to see if you've got it because like that, that is actually one of journalists main like bitches. Don't ask me if I got the email. <laughs> I will not do that then. <laughs> do that. But you could say, you know, dear Annette, um, I sent you a media release on this date and it was about this. Um, I just wanted to give you a little bit more information. Um, oh, and I, I and here's some more pictures. Oh, okay. So some different. Love to, love to hear back from you. But if you're doing the media hack that I suggested, then they've already emailed you and told you to bugger off. Um, that you, the next thing that you do is you pick up the phone. You know, hey journalist, it's Annette Dedsham here. Do you have a minute to talk? Really important. How often do you get people who just go, Bleh! and you're like going, oh, I've got to go to the loo or I'm just <laughs> lunch or, you know, whatever that is or on, on deadline. Yeah, sure, I do. Hey, um, I sent you a media release on this day. It was about this. And wait a minute. And they'll go, oh, I don't think I received it, mate. Can you send it through again? Oh, yeah, I did get it. We're not interested. Okay, awesome. Thanks very much. Cheers. Bye. Yeah you did it okay let me just check your email address oh uh, yeah it takes you a couple of minutes and that's like in in the game it's called selling the story in so that you get buy-in and sometimes they just need that little extra push like oh okay yeah i did see that i was really busy at the time tell me more 
Interesting. All right, bloody hell. Bloody hate ringing people. Yeah, me too. It well, sucks. <laughs> you hate it as well, and that's part of your job. Oh, no. Yeah, I hate it. I hate it. It's annoying. It's like, could you just say yes or no? Like, seriously, how hard is it? But it's a really valuable skill to have. And once you're on the phone, like if you've sent a few out, just, you know, put aside 15 minutes, a couple of days later, bang out the calls. Chances are they won't answer the phone anyway. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if you've got their phone number or their um, mobile, you can text them. Hey, blah, blah, blah. This is what I did. Get back to me. Um, and if they don't answer the phone, hop on the email and follow them up that way. And what I know that works in PR as well, it's said even though it's not that big in Australia, that um, tweet, like tweeting people and building the relationships up, not harassing them straight away, but building up media relations through Twitter is pretty good too. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, like you can still do that in Australia. Like if you're watching the news and you, you're looking at the reporters and they're on their phones, chances are they're tweeting about the story. You know, they're not messaging their husband to say, can you get some bread, darling, on the way home? They're, <laughs> they're tweeting. So if you do, and that's an important part of um, PR, and you know, the R in PR is relations. It's mm -hmm. about relationships. So the more that you can foster those relationships, whatever means necessary, definitely do it. Uh, it just, it's really valuable. And they get to know you, you get to know them, and then you have this great relationship going where you become their go-to person. Yeah, yeah, that's really interesting. And, you know, you were saying about the video thing as well. I wonder, when I really wanted a big speaker a few months ago, I was being ignored completely, but I was dead set on getting her, and I sent her, like, a video email, and then she, like, confirmed. And I wonder if that would work with journalists as well as, like, you know, a follow-up, because then they could see if you're good on camera, they can hear your voice because I know like for me personally I am much better I'm I am like a writer by trade but I'm much better at speaking and presenting that way than I am like the writing side and yeah it's just I wonder if that could be effective yeah absolutely it's like the um, product I was telling you about before the video you yeah. could do that get onto zoom and go hey Betty it's Annette Densham I'm from the audacious agency and blah, 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 here's our story. Mm. Um, you know, I'd love for you to get back to me, my phone number. You know, like you can even be fancy and put some captions underneath, you know, or the, have you seen the new Facebook filters? Oh, yeah. Okay. They are amazing. Look at this. You're going to laugh. You're doing it on yourself. Yeah, look at that. Oh, wow. I've now got a beard. And filters for everyone that will be listening to this as a podcast and now has a beard. <laughs> <laughs> where it came from. Wait, is it, are you doing this on Zoom or is it on Facebook? Or you can even go in, they've got video filters now and you could put yourself in a television like I have just done and go, this is Annette Densham reporting from the audition <laughs> agency. Like do something that gets their attention. Like what have you got to lose? What's the worst thing that they can say? No. But the name of the game is to stand out. Yeah. And if you're not prepared to stand out, then you're not going to get the wins that you really want. It's so true. Yeah, I, I love that. And whenever I can figure out how to make myself into a TV, I'm going to do that. That's um, really good advice. And like, what would you say are like some of the things journalists really hate? Like, We've covered some of them, but how, how do you go about really annoying a journalist? Um, look, if they contact you and you don't get back to them, that's really annoying. They've, they've reached out to you and you've not responded in a timely fashion or you've kept them waiting or they've had to chase you for the deadline. That's annoying because they've got someone yelling at them to get the story over the line. So if you have pitched a story out and... Make sure you answer your phone or you check your emails um, because there's like nothing worse than a missed opportunity. Um, you know, the, you know, saying, did you get my email? They hate that as well. And I guess too is clarifying with them the best method of contact for them because for those who really do hate the phone, then if you can say, what's the best way for me to communicate with you? 
And if they do go email, then try to honour that as much as possible. Although it still bamboozles me why you'd be a journalist if you don't want to pick up the phone. Oh, that was me. I bloody hated the phone and I hated being rang because I didn't want them to sell. So I'm like, just email me. <laughs> Not because I was being a dick, just because I got so scared on the phone. I don't know. Maybe it's, maybe they just don't like being social and that's why they're writers. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah. yeah. Um, and do you think there are, you know, we talked about different lead times. So you've got, you know, different lead times for dailies, obviously, and then um your magazines but with so much going online now what does it look like when you're pitching to like an online digital editor are the rules changing again uh look some publications will only run one story from you per month mm. uh, because they actually do plan their content in advance um, a lot of the online media particularly the ones where you like thrive global where you can sign up for an account and you can put in your own content whenever you like. Mm. Um, it's always good to read the contribution guidelines, uh, the contributors guidelines, because it'll actually tell you there how often they'll run your story, how many words they want, um, you know, what format they want it in it, what images that they would like to go with it, whether you can promote you or not, whether they'll give you a backlink, whether they need um, a bio from you, so that's really handy. Like if, if you're looking to do something like Thrive Global, which is also great PR, mm. um, is to just search um, contribution sites. And there's many of them. There's like, I can't even think of them off the top of my head, like um, Breathe Magazine and Tango and Thrive Global and Flying Solo and Business Women Media and Koshi's Business Builders and inside small business, they are always all looking for great content. So it's just a matter of whatever industry you're in, search that and it might be beauty, contribution sites, beauty magazine submissions, right. um, and search that through Google and they'll come up with a list of, you know, you can just keep clicking for pages of these magazines and build your own media contact list. That's great as well. It helps with the breadcrumbs and also with your SEO, I'm imagining, because I mentioned the contribution sites as part of you contributing for free or whatever, you get a backlink. Absolutely. You are writing for Thrive Global, which is Ariana Huffington's mm. online publication. That's got pretty good street cred from a, a backlink point of view. So when you're looking at those type of sites, you are looking for something with a high domain authority. So something that Google looks at and goes, you know what, they're better than you and we're going to reward you with those beautiful backlink traffic to you. Um, I just, you know, things like Fast Company, Inc, um, Smart Company, Entrepreneur Magazine, you know, there's just so many of them out there that are looking for good content. Yeah. They to write that content, they're not going to write it for you. So this is where having that skill in writing is important or working with a great writer. To, to represent you well. You don't want to send them some dodgy work. No, absolutely not. That would be terrible. That's not good. I actually found out about Thrive Global because one of our coaches writes for them, um, Jo Gifford, and I was researching her to build her profile on our site. And I was like, what is this? She's writing for Ariana Huffington. And then I saw like you can become a contributor like that. It never even occurred to me. Yeah, there are a lot out there of the thing. And this is the P and PR, so it's public, but it's also about perception. So PR is a lot about creating that perception that you're everywhere, which is the breadcrumbs. But also, when, like when you, it's really easy to get a Thrive Global account. Like you go Google Thrive Global contributor and you just log in and you sign up yourself and away you go. They do author, they do have to approve your content. But it's not hard. It's actually really easy to do um, because then the perception is, oh, my God, you're writing for Ariana Huffington? That's amazing. You know, in the, in the, the eyes of your prospective client, mm. they're going to go, they're a bit of all right. Yeah, that's really cool. I love that. And um, is there 
anything in terms of getting yourself on, I know we've covered a little bit of it, onto, you know, TV and podcasts, is that you should be having more videos up of yourself on things like that, so like YouTube and your website and things like that, more video content? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, people like video more and more because we have very short attention spans now. Reading 400 words takes way too long. Um, but because most modern cars um, are built in with podcast um, functionality or Bluetooth, is a lot of people do listen to things while they're driving or while they're working. I mean, like you, you can't be sitting there writing something and reading something at the same time, but you could be writing something and listening to something. So the more that, and this is what I suggest to people, is take your blogs or your media releases and turn them into video content. Create a YouTube channel, a Vimeo channel, whatever channel. Um, put the, the content onto your website because that helps you with your organic growth. And give people an opportunity to see you because, you know, is it like, if you're a great writer, people will feel something. Yeah. But when you're speaking, when you're looking at a camera, they can see your smile. They can see, you know, the little quirks about you. They can hear the intonations in your voice. They can hear whether you're being sarcastic or whether you're being serious. So video is a really powerful tool and not enough of us. Like I don't even use enough video. It's really powerful because it's just that really quick snapshot of that other human being and, and for journalists as well. I love your idea of the, the email video. It's fantastic. Oh, well, I've only done it once, but it did work. I don't know if journalists would like it. It certainly worked on my speaker, which is good. Um, and like, so finally, before we, you know, we point everyone to where your very important links and there's a good course that we need to discuss as well. What are your sort of final tips for people in, you know, getting into the media or anything that we haven't discussed or that you wish people knew? You know, the most important tip is don't give up. You know, like you could go and learn all the skills. You can pay someone to do it for you. You can have your website speak. You can have your great media kit. Uh, you know, you can brain dump all the different type of story angles and ideas that would appeal to your target media. But it's only as good as what goes on between your ears. And that includes that resistance to no. That includes persistence, that willingness to keep pushing forward and keep trying different ways to do things. And it was, requires consistency. You know, you can't just send one media release out, go, that didn't work. What a stupid thing that was. And then go, well, why does, why does the media ring me? Mm. Well, because you didn't do all of those things. And that comes from your head. You know, you have to really work on that, uh, particularly your business on an ongoing basis to overcome those things. And I guess the other thing is there's really no room in business for modesty. Like you cannot be in a small business and use the excuse, and, and I sound a bit harsh here, just this is my mum voice as my kids would say, mm -hmm. is that if you're shy, if you're an introvert, that's fine. But at some point, if you want to get your business out there, you want people to know who you are, what you do, how you do it, why you do it, the problem, the solution you've got for people's problems, you have to put yourself out there. You have to promote yourself. You have to. You have to. You just have to. Otherwise, you will remain the best kept secret and you'll be frustrated, you'll be annoyed and you'll quit. Yeah. Now, there's far too many talented people out there for that to happen. So if it is something that you struggle with, get some help. There's heaps of people out there who can guide you, coach you and mentor you to get over that feeling of uncomfortableness of pitching yourself. Now, it may be hard to believe, but I have been a, I was a shy kid, incredibly shy, painfully shy. And I don't really like being the center of attention, but when I started my business, even with all the skills I have in PR, it was like, oh, I don't want to put myself out there. People are going to laugh. People are going to do something. They're going to hate me. They're going to troll me. They're going to think I'm an idiot. 
but when I realised that I didn't have big marketing budget, that I couldn't pay for ads, that I couldn't do the stuff that kept me behind the scenes, mm. is that I realised that I had to just do one thing. And that one thing I did was I entered a business award. I went, what's the most audacious, bold, scary thing that I could possibly do is I can put myself in the spotlight. So I entered a business award and I won. Yes. Holy crackers. <laughs> How did that happen? <laughs> so over the, it gets easier. The more that you do it, it really does get easier. Initially, it's going to feel awkward and icky and uncomfortable. But the more that you do it, the more wins you'll get and the better you'll feel and you go, you know what? I'm, I'm ready to take over from you on a bed on a current affair. Yes, I love it. I love it. Yeah, that's the scariest one, isn't it? Entering yourself into an award. You feel like such a dickhead when you're saying, Betty has done this one thing once and her mum said it was great. I mean, you obviously wouldn't say that. <laughs> I was doing it for some awards recently and I didn't finish it because I was just like, nah. No, but no, I understand that it's, it's, it's a validation point as well, isn't it, for any further business? Yeah, it's third-party credibility. And look, when you, when you take that awards process and you commit yourself to it, I think you'll be surprised by what you've actually accomplished. Mm -hmm. And I, because awards writing is one of our specialties. And I encourage everybody, grab a piece of paper, sit down, just brain dump everything you've done in the last 12 months don't edit yourself go back over your diary you know look at what podcasts you've been on you know the people you've spoken to the zooms you've attended the the way that you adapted and changed through corona the you know the the media the articles the blogs the videos all the things that you've done in your business and even if you never enter an award you look at that you go you know what i've done a lot i've grown like I have increased my clients by 15% or I've increased my bottom line this much. We don't focus enough on that. We just get in day to day, do what we have to do and then move on to the next thing. It's time to stop and acknowledge and go, I'm actually doing a really good job. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. Well, thank you so much for that. And Lisa, did you have any questions as well? Like, uh, I've just been making notes really. I think I've not got any questions or such. I think the biggest thing for me is getting past the frustration because I'm not a PR person. I, my background is social media and I'm now in a situation where I work for myself and I'm not shy. You know, Betty will tell you, I'm quite happy to, I will ring people. I have no problem doing that. But I think what I find is, is, is I find it very difficult when I'm trying to gain PR is to keep the momentum as in keep, to keep like you were saying before and don't give up it's really really hard not to give up when you're sending press releases to people you're following up with people you're ringing people you're putting content out there and you're not necessarily getting pick up and i know these things take time and there's a million and one people who want to get um pre media attention to but i think that's the thing that i find the hardest and then what i find as well is that I question myself and I'm sure we all do this. You know, I'm not, and my thing is, well, I'm, I'm my first thing I'll say to people, I'm not a PR person. And one of the things I think is, you know, I need to stop saying that I just need to try. And that's all I do. I'm the sort of person I will put a press release together. I'll send it out to people and I'll see what happens and I'll follow up. I'm always the sort of person I'd rather try and fail than fail having not tried. But I do find it. I do find it quite, I do find it quite daunting to do. And also it's just maintaining that kind of that kind of spirit and belief of not giving up and keeping going and I've had some success with it I've had coverage in Forbes glamour magazines I've been doing quite a few things recently and I've been trying to secure more tv stuff but it is really really hard to like not to give up that's the thing for me is that like I keep going and I keep going and saying oh god I've got a really good story why won't they just pick it up <laughs> that's the thing for me at the moment it's like I'm not I'm not I'm not scared of trying. I mean, I am, but I'm not. I'm not scared to the point where I won't do it. I'll get to a point where I think, you know what, Lisa? I always go back to Nike's tagline is just do it. And I will just pick up a phone. I will send an email. I'll even send a video on Instagram DM. I've no issue doing that. But it's this thing that for me, I get really frustrated. And I'm sure everyone else does. It isn't just me. But I always, I just, I just, 
it's just this thing of just keeping going and I'm thinking to myself has was that press release right am I being annoying am I not getting it right I'm obviously I'm not a journalist so maybe they're just seeing my email and thinking god this is a pile of crap (laughs) and not getting back to me it's just this because it's just it's an unknown for me but my thing is I'll just put myself out there and see what happens and if something comes from it great if something doesn't then I'll keep trying until it does but it's really hard to maintain that momentum really really hard and then I, my thing at the moment is I watch a lot of the news I watch a lot of people and I watch journalists like you were saying before if they're on their phone they're probably tweeting so I'll go on Twitter and I'll look to see how they have they tweeted something and it's like right what can I do I watch other people who appear on tv shows and stuff I think right what can I do and I watch what they do and I make notes and think right okay well I can do that so and I know I can so if they're on there doing that like I want to be on there doing that and it's just like constantly reaching out to people it's quite exhausting (laughs) and it's not my job (laughs) if if i can suggest that the media is not the be all and end all when it comes to pr is that do weave those other elements into it you know writing articles for third-party sites yeah getting on podcasts for entering awards they all add to those breadcrumbs right it does make it easier when you start to see wins from the mm. other perspective as well. Like there are so out there that, you know, people are like podcast hungry that they, like I said, is if they're sitting in their car, they don't necessarily want to be listening to the dribble on the news or mm. on the radio. They want to be listening to something that they can learn, be inspired or, or grow through so that's also PR. I think we, we tend to chuck the media and go, well, that's PR. And look yeah, that's what I think. Yeah, I, I, I do podcasts. I write for third party publications, stuff like that. I do all that stuff. But for me, like my thing at the moment is I've managed to do all that stuff and I will carry on doing it. But I really want to get some TV coverage. And I'm probably, I'm probably a little bit too fixated on it right now, if I'm being honest. I need to kind of maybe walk myself back from that because it's like, right, I need to get on Sky News. If I can get on Sky News, you know, that's an audience of blah, blah, blah. And I do my research and I'll go and read up, see how much the viewing figures are, audience figures. Like, I'm right, okay, if I could just get a bit of exposure, television exposure, that would help as well. And I think, like I said a few seconds ago, I think I've maybe become a little bit too fixated on that one. It's a big thing for you. And look at pitching to them and just go keep doing all of the other things. And it's, it's so every month or every couple of weeks, you go to them with a story because eventually one of them will land and you will get that. But, you know, like the thing with TV is, you know, they've got that audience right then and there, but it's mm-hmm. here today, gone tomorrow. Part of that process is all also about how you leverage all of this stuff that you're doing. So if you've got on a podcast, how are you repurposing and reusing that, that more people can see it? And having a plan is really important in any aspect of business so that those times when you feel like giving up, you know, hang on, I've actually got this other thing that I've got slotted to do next week. I'm going to focus on doing that. Um, And and look, this whole thing, like we, we live in a generation where we expect instant or quick results Mm. and it's never going to happen no matter how much social media and how much the media make us believe that if you take this pill you know you'll drop 50 kilos in 6.7 seconds Mm. putting relationships with your audience even the media takes time it will always take time there is no way to fast track no like and trust because it comes back down to how you connect with people. And if you are doing all that you say you're doing, I don't even think you realise yet the impact that you're having because, you know, we started this by saying, how do people find you? Like quite often they Google or search you. Is those person, people who are watching what you're doing, reading your content, listening to your podcast, they may not be ready to buy from you right now, but they may be ready 21 touches away because... You know, back in the old day, if you wanted to sell something, it took five closes. You had to ask five times. Now it's anywhere from 12 and up. You know, you've got to be seen 12 to 20 times before someone buys from you. And if you think about that, that's almost half a year. That's crazy. So, but it's, it's not unusual because 
we are bombarded with information. Like how many people are over Zooms? How many people are just over the negativity on social media? If you can be that light and be that voice of, here's my thing, I can solve your problem. And you just consistently keep showing up. That's how you build a brand. And that's how you get that recognition. Um, what a like, note to end on. I couldn't get, <laughs> get that word. A minute. Um, that is amazing, Annette. Thank you so much. I realise that we are over just because we can't stop listening to your amazing advice. Where, in fact, not, I don't want to go into where can we find you yet. Tell us about your coaching package, like, because that sounds amazing to me. Okay, so we've got uh, the most audacious coaching program. It is a six month program. And it's 97 bucks a month. I don't know what that is in pounds, but you can <laughs> buy a loaf of bread with it, given what the pound is like. It's 97 Australian. And every fortnight, we hop online with who we was ever a part of it. And we go through the basics of brand building and PR, writing your media releases, writing your bio, getting the right pictures, making sure your social media um, platforms updated, um, creating media kits, videos, entering awards, writing books, just all the things that can help you drop those breadcrumbs. And over that six months, um, we've got what's called brand new bingo. So you get a bingo sheet at the start of it. And as we go through this, you've got little activities to do each week, really tiny things, like things like go update your Facebook bio, or go update your banner. Or uh, if you're sharing a blog, go use Bitly so that you can track the number of, number of people who click it. Really practical things so that you can see the impact of what you're doing. So yeah, that's over six months. That's awesome. That sounds great. And where, where can people find that and find you online? So if they go to the, uh, the Audacious Agency, a-U-D-A-C-I-O-U-S agency.com um, and go to services and click on coaching. Everything about the coaching program is there. Uh, we're on Facebook, Audacious Agency. Uh, we're on, I don't think we're on Instagram or we might be, I always forget about Instagram. Um, or look up Annette Densham. Um, I'm, I'm everywhere, I'm everywhere. You are. When I was Googling you, you really are everyone. You're practicing what you preach. Absolutely. It's taken me eight years to have the presence that I, I think I take up 12 pages on Google. <laughs> and, you know, and I own that space. Wow. Yeah, you're like, I am Google. I love it. Google. Cool. We call it, how can we help you be Googleicious? Oh, Googleicious. That's a whole other course. Yeah. I love it. Cool. Well, thank you very much for your time. Absolutely loved it. And I'll put in the show notes, some of the links to like your course and the website and yeah, and we'll put this everywhere as well. So watch this space. Thank you. And thank you, Lisa, for attending and you're awesome. No cool. Thank you. thank you. That was awesome. Thanks. Okay, take care. Bye. Good day. Bye.